How about the message of that song, huh? There couldn't be a better time to hear that. It is well. I appreciate our folks who've been coming up week after week and pre-recording our worship, leading us in worship. And I hope, I hope that you've been able to connect with the Lord even in your living room as we've, as we've been able to, to be led in worship uh, of the Lord. And I want you to think about that regardless of what's going on. If Jesus lives inside of you, you know what? It is well. Amen. Hey, let me remind you of where we've been on this journey as we've looked at the autobiography of Jesus. We're looking at what Jesus said about himself. If you remember when this started several weeks ago, we started in John chapter 6. Jesus had just fed the 5,000 with a little boy's lunch, just a couple of biscuits and a a few fish, and he multiplied that out and fed 5,000 individuals. And then the very next day, they show up wanting their bellies filled again and wanting wanting Jesus to fill their stomachs. And Jesus made this statement, I am the bread of of life. He said, you know what? I will satisfy the deepest desires of your soul and not just filling your stomach, but filling your soul. And then in John chapter eight, uh, Jesus encounters a lady who was caught in sin, the sin of adultery. And, and people had brought her to him in the, after they had caught her in the very act of adultery. And in that, Jesus mentions to her a life that was covered in darkness. And, she, and he says, I'm the light of the world. He said it again in John chapter 9 to a man who he heals who has been born blind. His life was, his sight was covered in darkness. And Jesus made that statement again, an I am statement in John 9. He said, I am the light of the world. Then in John chapter 10, Jesus said about uh, himself, I'm the door. You remember what we talked about, that him being the door was access. He gives us access to the Father, that he provides protection for us. Just in the next couple of verses, we found another I am statement in John 10, where he said, I am the good shepherd, and he who hears my voice and follows me will be my sheep. And, and what a powerful statement that God wants to lead us. Jesus came to this world to lead us, to guide us, to provide for us. We went to Psalm 23 and looked at David's, the shepherd psalm in that. And, and then last week in John chapter 11 at the cemetery where Lazarus lay dead, um, Mary and Martha come to him. And we looked at that conversation that Martha had with Jesus. And she really asked him that question, where were you? Had you been here, my brother would not have died. And you remember what Jesus said in John chapter 11? He said, Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. You see, Jesus is leading us. He's pointing us. He's showing us who he is by each of these statements. He's revealing himself to us as humanity to show us that he loves us and he came to this world not so that we can be a Baptist or to buy into some religion. Jesus Christ came to this world because he desires to have a relationship with you and with me. You see, that's my prayer for you this morning. As we turn another chapter and we look at another statement that, of what Jesus says about himself is that God would show you right there where you are how much he loves you and that through Jesus Christ he wants to have a relationship with with you. So if you've got your Bible, I want you to turn to John chapter 14 this morning. Now, for, for some of us, this may be a, a, a very familiar passage of Scripture in John chapter 14. And, and to give you just a little bit of the context, this is about 48 hours prior to Jesus dying on the cross. And he's getting his disciples ready. He's getting them ready to experience and to see him crucified. He's already told them uh, over and over again, I'm going to have to leave you or I'm going to Jerusalem to die. Um, And and, and he told them over and over again. But, But here in John chapter 14, he looks all of them in the eye. If you can imagine this, for the last three years, Jesus has poured in to this handful of men He has spent uh, the last three days, day and night. They have heard him teach. Um, They have seen him do miracles. They have watched uh, as the multitudes gather to him, to hear him, to see him, and just to, to touch him. And Jesus looks at them just two days before the crucifixion, 
and, and he said these words. In the midst of the turmoil in their hearts and in their minds, he says this in John chapter 14, verse 1. Maybe this is exactly what you need to hear this morning. Let not your heart be troubled. Let me stop right there. That's a great word for us. Just in the midst of our circumstances, in, in, involved with everything that's going on around us, the economy that seems to be tanking, uh, just the, 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 all of the news that we get uh, on our television set day after day after day, that listen to what the Lord said. Don't let your heart be troubled. He, he speaks about a peace that you and I can have that this world doesn't provide. He, he, he's talking about how can chaos be going on around us and yet in us, we be overwhelmed with peace, that our hearts wouldn't be troubled. Look, look, at, look at what else he says. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now listen to what Jesus just said in these first few verses. He said, listen, regardless of what's going on around us, regardless of what's going to happen in the next few days, you have peace that surpasses all of human logic. He said, you don't let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in the Father, if you believe in God, you believe also in me. I'm physical here in front of you. And, and listen, he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I'm going to come back and receive you unto myself. Je Jesus was telling them exactly how it was going to unfold in the next few days. He said, hey, listen, I I'm going to die. And, and a few days after that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this world and I'm going to go to the Father. And I'm going to prepare an eternal home for you, a place for you, a, a mansion, he says in this passage. And he says, and, and I'm not going to leave you here. I'm going to come back. Now, that's the promise, he says. So, so Jesus says, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to provide a place, but I'm going to place in you a promise that you will not spend eternity here in this world, but I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. Now listen, church, that's good news. I mean, if this ended at verse 4, that, that's, that's the best news that we could ever have. So some, some of us need to hear that this morning, that you and I can have peace that surpasses human logic, that, that there's a place that Jesus is preparing for us, and that one day he's going to come back, the promise that he's going to return and receive us unto ourselves. That's literally the gospel in those first four verses. But, but listen, to what, uh, listen to what Thomas says. Thomas always is, he gets a bad rap. Thomas was the one who, who kind of questioned, questioned whether or not Jesus was resurrected a little bit later. Um, but, but here Thomas is inquisitive. Here Thomas is asking questions like maybe you and I would ask if we were in that group of disciples. And Jesus had just laid out this plan and he, he just encouraged them with peace and he, he just told them about heaven. And, and Thomas asked this question, he's like, no, we don't know how to get to where you're going. Jesus said, I, I, you know the way to go. And Thomas says, hang on, time out. Well, how do we get there? Look, look at what he says. It's in verse 5. He said, then Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. And how can we know the way? And here it is, the I am statement in verse 6. Jesus looks at Thomas, he looks at the other disciples who are there, and he literally looks at you this morning, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. L listen, friend, Jesus just told you 
the way to heaven. Now, now I know in all of these messages that we've looked at, Jesus is revealing himself. He's speaking these things about himself. And, and nearly every one of them, Jesus is showing us, hey, I came here to this world because I want to have a relationship with you that's based upon grace that I want to offer you. But l- listen to what he just said. He says, I'm the, the way. You realize all of us in this world, there's three major questions all of us have in this world. We're just born with these questions inside of us. The first one is this, how can my sins be forgiven? If you remember in John chapter 3, there was a discussion that Jesus had with a religious guy. He came to Jesus at night. You remember the story. His name was Nicodemus. And in John chapter 3, it says that this guy was very religious. But his question was this, how can I be saved? How can I inherit heaven? What do I have to do on this earth in order to ensure my eternity? I want you to know that is a great question. And I believe that's a question all of us ask. When I was a little boy growing up in a home where my mom and daddy loved me very much, but church was not a priority. And growing up in a home where we spent a lot of time in the woods hunting, I remember as a young boy in the stillness of a deer stand contemplating the biggest question of my life. There's got to be more to this life than what I see and what I experienced. There's got to be a God out there. As I would sit in deer stands all by myself, watching the sun come up, and watch the world come alive as the sun rays would burst through those woods, hear the birds begin to uh, sing, and, and hear the world begin to wake up. God placed in me a question. How can I be saved? How can I know the God who created me? See, Nicodemus asked that question, and he was a religious man. Nicodemus asked that question, and he was raised differently than I was. Nicodemus asked that question in John chapter 3, and Nicodemus knew the Bible. He knew the rules of the Bible. He knew the religion that he was raised in. And yet there was still that question inside of him. There's got to be more than just rules. There's got to be more to this life and knowing God and spending eternity with him. Nicodemus asked the question, how? How can I be saved? And in John chapter 3, Jesus said, Nick, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen to what Jesus said. Nicodemus, you've kept all of these rules. You've been very religious. Literally, you've been a, a right man. You've checked off all the boxes. You go to church, you, uh, you pray your prayers, you read the Bible. But none of what Nicodemus did equaled salvation. And Jesus said, he who believes in me should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know what, as a young boy, I, I, I really, I, I thought that I could be good enough to go to heaven. Boy, I wasn't real religious. Our family wasn't religious. We didn't go to church on Sunday. I spent time hunting on Sunday. But I was a, I was a, I was a good kid. I, I, was, I, was, I probably wasn't the best kid, but I was decent, right? And I thought that maybe one day that I would stand before God and God would kind of weigh me out. That, that maybe it, that, that my good would outweigh the bad. All the lies that I told and the, the bad words that I said and the ugly jokes that I told or and maybe the good things that I did when I was nice to my friends or I was obedient to my parents, that, that maybe that somehow God would weigh me out on a scale and my good would outweigh my bad. I remember as a young boy contemplating all of this, wondering that deepest question, how can I spend eternity with God? And I wondered if it was going to be based upon a scale. 
that God would weigh out my good and my bad. You see, if that were true, Nicodemus, Jesus would have told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Nick, you're good enough. You've done a lot of religious things. You know the Scripture. You've checked the boxes. But that's not what Jesus said. It wasn't about boxes. It wasn't about being good. It wasn't about religion. Jesus said you've got to believe. Believe and you shall not perish. Believe in me and you shall not perish. Look back in John chapter 14. The subject's heaven. In the midst of chaos... He looks at his disciples and he says, I'm the way. He answers the question for them and for us. How can we be saved? How can we be saved? And I want you to hear this. Friend, the only way for your sins to be forgiven, the only way for you to spend eternity in heaven is through Jesus Christ. He is The way. You might say, oh, preacher, that's very narrow minded. Listen, I'm not being narrow minded. Jesus said, I am the way. Let me ask you this question before we move forward. Has there been a time in your life that you trusted not in your good works, not in your church attendance, not in something that you have done, but has there been a time in your life that you trusted in what Jesus Christ has done for you? Have you believed? in the one that God has sent for your eternity, for your eternal life. Well, look at the next thing. Jesus said in this I am statement, he said, I am the way, but then he says, I am the life. Now, I want you to know something. That's another big question for us. The the first question all of us ask is, how can I be saved? But the next question most of us ask is, is how can this be true? How can I be sure that Jesus is who he said he is? How can I really believe the things in the Bible? I want, you to, I want you to think about the Lord Jesus. He is the most recognized individual that has ever been born upon this earth. All the way through history, you can take the most popular kings that have ever ruled and reigned on this earth. You you can take the individuals that the most books have ever been written about, the greatest histories, the greatest war generals, the uh, the greatest kings that have ever lived and ruled and reigned on this earth, and all of them pale in comparison to the things that have been written about Jesus Christ. So, so, so how can we ask this question? Is this true? Is Jesus really the way? Because he answers it in this next statement. He says, I am the truth. Now watch this. The world celebrates the birth of Jesus. Not, not just Christians, not just the church, but the world as a whole. No matter what continent you live on, no matter what language you speak, all of us celebrate the birth of Jesus. Now, we celebrate it in kind of odd ways, and we, we have allowed um, paganism and even materialism to come in and, and steal the meaning of Christmas. But all of us, I've been to China, I've seen Christmas trees. I've been to China, I've seen Santa Clauses in China. All of us around this globe that we go to Africa and Kenya, they they celebrate the birth of Jesus. There's no other person in human history that the world celebrates their birth. All around this world, people, the world, not just believers, celebrate his birth. But watch this. We also acknowledge his life. Did you realize that just a few months ago, we rolled over January 1, 2020. The year acknowledges the birth of Jesus Christ. Years ago, Julius Caesar developed a 
calendar, later uh, the Gregorian calendar that we use today. But, but both of those calendars acknowledge that there was a time of B.C., before Christ, and then there was a moment where uh, we recognize the date as A.D., Addo Dominion, and that means the year of our Lord. And so our calendar, when you write the date, not just us as Christians, but everyone in this world acknowledges the life of Jesus Christ. There's not another person born on this planet that the world acknowledges his life. But every one of us, when we write a date, we acknowledge the life of Jesus Christ. But watch this. That's not it. I'll tell you what, there, you and I will see a symbol of his death, and, and we recognize his death. You don't have to be a Christian to see a cross, and, and whether there's been thousands or millions of people who have died of crucifixion in, in, in the first century, but there's one person who died of crucifixion that the symbol, the cross, reminds everybody of his death. So think about it. All of the world celebrates his birth. We acknowledge his life by the calendar. We recognize his death by the symbol of the cross. And I want you to know something about this. Every year in the spring, we, we, get, we get to the time in spring where Easter comes, and for all of the world, it's a three-day weekend. We get Friday off of our work, and then on that Sunday is the celebrating the resurrection. Now, now this may be the thing that this world has the most questions about. Now, it, it may be one thing to acknowledge that somebody was born. That, that's every, all of us have been born. And, and, you know, it's really not that significant to recognize or acknowledge somebody's life because all of us have experienced life. And, and, and the, you know, all of us will experience death. And so it may not be that big of a deal to recognize the symbol of death that Jesus died. But the resurrection, that's where many of us get hung up on. But listen to what Jesus said. He said, I am, remember last week, I'm the resurrection and the life. Jesus made a claim before his death that his life, his body would come back to life. Now, I want you to think about this because you may be hung up on the resurrection. It may be that empty tomb that, that gets you. You may say, I don't believe all you Christians that believe that Jesus is alive Again, In fact, you might even say that, you know what, I can understand his birth, his life, and his death being a significant things that took place in the, in the scope of human history. This person did incredible things, but his resurrection is one thing I can't believe. In fact, some people have even said, you know what, probably his disciples... When Pilate had placed the guards in front of the tomb to secure the tomb, uh, maybe his disciples uh, snuck in. Maybe the guards fell asleep and they snuck in, and in some way they rolled that stone away and they stole the body of Jesus and they hid him, his body, in a different place so that all of the world would be duped to think that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. Maybe the resurrection is such a huge hurdle for you to get over logically in your mind that in some way you have composed an idea that certainly these believers, the disciples, took the body and hid him so that this whole world would believe that Jesus was resurrected. Now, if, if that's what you believe, let's think through that for a minute. All of the disciples died a horrible death because they were followers of Jesus. All of those disciples, all the way down, all of those 11 that remained after Judas and Matthias, who would come later in Acts chapter 1, every one of them, excluding John, died a horrible death because they believed that Jesus was alive. I want you to know something. You and I, we lie to get out of trouble, not to get into trouble. 
those disciples, while they might have lived for a lie, they would not have died for a lie. One of them would have said, you know what? You're absolutely right. Here's where we've hidden his body. But nobody, nobody, any of his disciples said, this is where he is. You want to know why? Because Jesus is alive. The Bible itself tells us that over 500 people saw him with their eyes after the resurrection. Jesus says in John chapter 14, hey, listen, I'm the way to heaven, but I'm the truth. You can be certain of who I am, that I am who I said I am, that I did what I said I'd do, and I want you to know something. You and I in this world can believe Jesus because he is the truth. You and I can be certain of that. But here's the last thing. Jesus said, I'm the life. Here's the third question you and I have. First of all, we ask, how can I be saved, like Nicodemus asked. Then we say, how can we be sure that Jesus is who he says he is? He says, I'm the truth. But then the next question that is deep in our heart is, how can you and I, how can I be satisfied? How can my life be fulfilled? How can my life be filled and be satisfied? And Jesus answers it in that one statement. He says, I am the life. You know, this may sound familiar because last Sunday we looked at that when Jesus in the cemetery said, I'm the resurrection and the life. We talked about that life, not just being eternal life, but being life abundant here on this earth. Jesus says, listen, I can fulfill, I can fill your deepest needs. Do you know oftentimes in our life, we try to fill that void in us that we need to be satisfied. We try to fill it with temporary things. Everything in, in our life here on this earth is temporary. You might say, well, I, I've, I've got a job. Well, certainly realize in this season of life that jobs and those things are temporary. I've got a 401k. <laughs> well, listen, you and I realize that, that our security cannot be found in our wealth or our retirement that's a temporary thing maybe you say my family I, I i get satisfaction in a house full of people and and maybe in this quarantine you've had that you you've been surrounded by the people you care about and you say hey you know what i'm satisfied but i want you to know something look around that living room everyone that sits by you temporary 50 years from now most of those people won't be here anymore. You know, that's, that's not sad, it's reality, isn't it? We, we place our faith in the temporary things of this life. We try to satisfy our life with the pleasures of this world. That's what we talked about last Sunday, filling our life with the temporary. And Jesus says, I'm what you're looking for. I'm the life that you desire. I'm the life that can fill your void in you that you're looking for. I, I want to read this quote to you. It's from C.S. Lewis. Now listen to this. He says, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Friend, I want you to think about that. If I find in myself a desire, a desire that no experience in this world can satisfy, then I've got to come to the conclusion that I was made for another world. Friend, you're made for another world. God made you to spend eternity with Him. Here's the questions. How can I be saved? Jesus said, I'm the way. How can I be sure? Jesus says, I'm the truth. Here's a question. How can I be satisfied? And Jesus said, I'm the life. And he wraps it all up with this statement. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus said, I'm the only way 
to heaven. I'm the only way to the Father. It's not by what you do. I'm the way. Jesus on the cross bridged the gap that, that sin and death separated us from God. Jesus on the cross bridged that gap. And the only way to heaven, the only way to the Father is through Jesus Christ. Has there been a moment in your life that you've acknowledged your sin? You, and that's not a popular word. I get it. Has there been a time that you've acknowledged that you are undone and broken before God and you surrendered your life to him completely through the sacrifice of Jesus. Walked away from your old life and walked in a new life with Jesus Christ. You see, that's what God wants to do. That's why Jesus made these statements about himself. He wants to be your shepherd. He wants to be the door. He wants to satisfy you as the bread of life. He wants to be the light in the darkness of your life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way to heaven is through him. Why, why don't you pray this morning and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to bring you into a relationship with his Father? Why don't we pray together this morning? Bow, bow your head right there where you are and say something like this. Say, God, I know that I'm lost without Jesus. I know that he died on the cross for me to give me life. God, to make a way. God, I know that his life is true. His message is true. And God, I place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ this morning for my salvation. Save me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, friend, if you prayed that prayer this morning, would you do me a favor? Would you email me and let me know? You can send an email to info at fbchalton.org and let us know. Our staff would love to find out and be able to connect with you. You know what I'm going to say this too. Maybe you're watching on Facebook or KPXJ and you don't have a church home uh, to go to. We would love to have you on June the 7th come here and, and be a part of our service. We're going to do three services. We'll start a first service at 8 o'clock, and it'll be for mainly our senior adults and those who have uh, some, some other pre-existing health issues. You can come at 8. The sanctuary will be as clean as it can be. We'll have uh, hand sanitizer stations everywhere. It's be a fist bump uh, zone only, no handshaking, any of that stuff. We'll gather together at 8, then we'll do it again at 930 you can come at 9.30. We'll have worship just like you saw today here in our sanctuary, and then we'll do it again at 11. So 8, 9.30, and 11, all starting on June the 7th. If you don't have a church home, come here to First Baptist Halton. We'll love to meet you. Thank you for watching.